going to move forward into the media brand uh, section now, which is going to be great fun. Uh, let's name the elephant in the room, because there's no point in not naming it. We all know that uh, Alexandra is here from Global Witness. Global Witness have a campaign running against uh, DLH. Uh, the guys from DLH aren't here today. They were here yesterday. Um, we're going to use that as an example of media and brand and all of that kind of stuff. Uh, that might be quite feisty, but hey, nobody died of being feisty, so that should be fun. Looking forward to that bit. Um, just on that subject, though, I'm going to try to steer away from the specific... Well, no, we're obviously going to use the specific case, but we're trying to steer away from the data in the case, because what we want to do is learn some stuff about brands and how it gets used and how it gets used well and badly. So, uh, that's where we're going with that. Brad, lead us into this promised Thank you. land. Um, good morning. Thanks all for turning out on the second day here. It's great to see everyone. Um, let's see here. Look at that. Uh, I see now I'm, I've been afraid to fall off the stairs here. Um, but if I stand here, then I'm in front of the... So I'll just stand maybe about here and not move too much. I tend to gesticulate, so I don't want to throw myself off the stage at least not un intentionally. Uh, my name is Brad Kahn. I am the Communications Director for the Forest Stewardship Council in the U.S., and I'm also Communications Advisor to FSC International. Um, I guess I wanted to start by apologizing on behalf of most Americans everywhere for uh, what I hope will not become a global financial crisis. Uh, the news is promising but not guaranteed this morning, but I, I thought it was an apropos of this discussion uh, because that word crisis gets thrown around a lot in media, and it, it reminds me of a good uh, quote from former Congressman Rahm Emanuel, who was President Obama's chief of staff, which was, never let a good crisis go to waste. And, and I think that, um, you know, that's the way a lot of people approach media relations, is it's a crisis, how do we use it in our favor? That's, that's considered strategic. And I'm actually going to try to push a little e upstream of that and suggest that's sometimes required. Sometimes you have to react. We're, we're going to hear about some of that today. But actually, the way we should come at media relations to, and by, by impact, I, I think we all get that you could negatively impact your brand. But what I'm kind of interested in is how do we use partnerships between FSC and whether certificate holders or uh, in NGOs to enhance, to, to positively impact our brand. Certainly there are negative impacts, but I'm gonna to try to look at what do we use in terms of strategy. And if you, if you take away one message today, it's that we should think of media relations just as we would think of a product launch or uh, an advertising campaign. You would never say, oh, I just got a call, we gotta launch a product in the next hour. I mean, but that's how we go into media relations sometimes, and, and it's, sometimes required because context matters, but it's not strategic. It's not the way we choose to act. So I'm going to try to focus on the ideal in this first presentation, and then we'll probably get into how we react uh, as we discuss. So the first thing I think about is why are we doing this? You know, raise awareness is not a reason. Nobody reads the newspaper anymore. It, it affects opinion leaders. It, it affects other things. But for FSC, it's about this. It's about the forest. And, and it struck me. I put this slide up because we've been in this room for a while now. And we haven't seen that many forest pictures. But this is what it's all about. And, and for some people, they see this and they think, ah, continuous supply of wood and fiber. Other people see, ah, biodiversity, 70% uh, of land animals live in forests. Other people think, ah, 1.6 billion people rely on forests to live. We come at this in different ways, but for us, it's about the forest. We're the Forest Stewardship Council. And, and so when we think about media, uh, for me, the question is, how do we use uh, media relations to drive trust in our brand to protect more forest for future generations. So, uh, you know, I, I just wanted to start with what I think is the whole reason we're in this room, even though we may see different things in that picture. And, and lest you think I'm typically northern in my perspective, we're also about this. This is a beautiful uh, tropical forest in the Congo Basin, not FSC certified, just found on Google Images, but nonetheless, a lovely forest. 
So the thing about media is we rely on independent third parties to communicate our message. It's what separates it from marketing, really. Marketing, we can control our message. Uh, earned media, we have to rely on journalists. And, and frequently, a, a step that people uh, don't invest enough time and energy in is, well, what, what do they care about? What motivates a journalist? And, and Edward R. Murrow is one of the more famous journalists from the United States. He also ran the London Bureau of CBS News for many years. Uh, what, what he's getting at is the motivations behind what drives journalism. And it's not just to take the press release that someone sends at them, but to try to dig behind it. And, and just like in any profession, there are good journalists and there are bad journalists. And people have lots of opinions about the state of journalism today. My own opinion is it's very interesting because there's lots of different publications. There's, everyone's got a niche. And I don't care if it's a tiny little blog. If that journalist is ambitious and does his or her job well, it's a good way to tell your story. Because once it's online and a credible third party has written a good story, it can bounce around the world. So we have to understand the motivations of the journalist. And, and frequently when we think about media, as I started with the Rahm Emanuel quote, we think about, well, a good story is about conflict. It's a war story. We love war stories, even though we may not like war. But that's why we see it on the news every night. It's a story that we can understand, people fighting. That's frankly what a campaign is about. It's a war story. But it's not the only kind of story that's out there. Um, I should remember. In giving talks, I need to remember to look at my notes. Uh, there are other kinds of stories. There's pull yourself up by the bootstrap stories. There's people taking risk, overcoming obstacles, trying something new to see if they can make a difference. I mean, that's a good story. It's people doing things for the first time ever, or perhaps on the leading edge of a big trend. There are different stories, and I think if we think about the journalist, especially if we have a specific journalist in mind, not just a generic one, but we say, oh, he or she is a good journalist, and I want to try to get them to write something. What kind of stories do they like? Do they like trend stories? Do they always write about conflict stories? What are the ones that we want to pitch? So um, I think we have to understand, in some ways, our audience before we use earned media to tell our story. And the thing about FSC is that we've got a lot of stories. Uh, because stories are about people. We love forests, but nobody writes a story about a forest. If you read a news article, there's always quotes. And those quotes are about real people, and the people tell the story. And I think frequently we, we get wrapped up in our commitment to clean water or re reduction of pesticide use or you know, protecting a, an endangered species or whatever, but none of those things are going to be interviewed by the reporter. So when I say the FSC network, what I mean is all the people affiliated with FSC everywhere in the world, whether that's the staff, whether that's the membership, whether that's the certificate holders, the partner organizations, uh, the chain of custody suppliers, the landowners, the communities in and around the forest. They all have stories, and they all relate to FSC, and they all relate to the companies and, and other organizations that we partner with. And I think this is our key asset. And in terms of what FSC's role is, I think this is what we first and foremost can bring, is these people with good stories, real stories, authentic stories. And so, for example, uh, recently, uh, Tetra Pak approached us and said, we've got a journalist who wants to write about Tetra Pak and how using forest products is good for forests, and, but they want to talk to some people. Can you help us? So, of course, we said, well, you should talk to Kim at FSC. He would be a great person to talk to. But we were able to provide a handful of other people from throughout the network to, to build that story out, to make it interesting. And the result was a good story, and there were some critical elements. We, you know, they, they spoke to some of our uh, allies who are also, we'll call them tough love allies, I won't name names. Um, and they provided a critical perspective, but overall the story was very effective, and we were able to build it with people who know the FSC system, because that's what we've got. Excuse me. So, perspective. Is this a responsibly managed forest, or is this forest destruction? I mean, sometimes the story gets framed for you. It, the reporter comes at you, and I mean, the, the, the classic example from US politics is you know, asking something like, you know, when did you start, stop beating your spouse? It's like, well, if that's the question, how do you answer that in a way that 
I don't look like a bad person. I mean, you know, I just reject that whole notion. So frequently, someone will come at you and ask you the equivalent of that stump. And, and yeah, I don't, I don't know. I mean, maybe that stump is part of a massive conversion. Or maybe that, although you can sort of see the trees in the background, but um, maybe that stump is actually part of a restoration project that was done because it was converted many years ago and now we're restoring it to natural forest. Or maybe there's endangered species habitat that that's part of a, uh, an effort to restore that habitat. Or, or possibly there is uh, high um, cultural value areas in the, in the region and that's part of a, a process to protect those. But if we come at it and say, well, let's talk about that stump, well, you know, we're kind of painting ourselves into a corner there, and I, I, I just, I offer it because, you know, that's kind of the metaphor for what comes at us a lot, is tell us about this stump. And I just suggest that if we're strategic about it, we might frequently pull back and say, okay, what's this really about? And that's, that's definitely not about avoiding the topic as much as just saying, well, really, what's the story here? So telling FSC's story. So uh, I, I think I'm violating what may be the first rule of good PowerPoint management, which is don't use small fonts. Um, so let me read this to you. Uh, this brand has a clean balance sheet, a lively marketing plan with tasteful notes of originality, and a strong fiscal year finish. N nobody's ever sold a bottle of wine tableside this way. But I think this is frequently how we try to tell our story. And not just, and I'm, you know, I'm the communications guy, right? So I, I'm not denying responsibility here. But um, I think it's also true in the CSR movement more broadly. We like to talk about ROI and, you know, how we're hitting goals and, you know, meeting objectives. And yeah, I mean, if, if you're talking to the Wall Street Journal or the Financial Times of London, maybe that's the story you need to tell. But most people are not going to sell their bottle of wine this way. They're going to try to talk about the characteristics and the values and, and how it makes you feel. You know, it's got a good nose feel or whatever those, mouth feel. What, I don't know what that means. I think it means lots of tannins. But anyway, you know, they, they're going to talk about the characteristics of the wine. And so I, I feel like we have good stories. We, we, we protect biodiversity. We protect water quality. We give people jobs. We uh, protect things that people really are near and dear to their religions and their cultures and their traditions. We have lots of good stories. So uh, instead of talking about the bottle of wine um, in, in sort of technocratic ways, I think we can look at the kinds of outcomes we're trying to produce. And, and at FSC US, we love this picture because, uh, well, because we just don't have that many pictures of kids running around in FSC certified forests. But, uh, but this really gets at the nut of what we're trying to do, is we're trying to create places that the next generation and the generation beyond will still value as healthy, working, functioning forest ecosystems. And um, so when we talk about the stories that we want to tell, you know, usually it's in context of who are we telling it with? Are we, you know, I, I look forward to hearing from uh, other folks on the panel. If it's Ikea, that will be a different story than if it's with Greenpeace or with, um, you know, a, a tribe in uh, South America. But uh, the context will matter, and, and frequently the place that, if we're going to be strategic about it, we all have brands, and ideally all of us can articulate the values that our brands hold near and dear. And so what I would say is, at FSC, our values around environmental, social, and economic uh, performance. And what are your values? What are the values that your organization are bringing to this table? And if we're going to be strategic, where do those values align with ours? And how do we tell stories that move both of those things forward. Because then we're really getting at the core of what our brand is about, and what our, both of our brands are about, and if we're going to use the media, so maybe our values are around uh, you know, future generations and leaving the, the world a living planet. Well, that's a great story for us to tell, and I suspect many of your organizations would like to tell that kind of story too. So I will just leave you to say that if, if we're going to work well together, yeah, sometimes we have to react quickly on a one-hour deadline and say, we need a comment, and I, I suspect I'll have a chance to offer some thoughts on that topic. But what I'd really embrace is the opportunity to work with some of you on a more strategic level, which starts with, what are we trying to do? What's the story we want to tell? How does it align with our brand and our values? And what are examples of that? And how do we tap the FSC network to tell those stories? Because we can do that. And I would love the opportunity to work with any of you to try. 
Thank you, Brad. Thanks. OK, well, we all know the format now. We've been working with it for a, for a, for a day, so we should be well practised. I just want the, the rest of the panel to say 20 or 30 seconds to introduce themselves. Then we'll get into questions. Um, you would not be surprised to know I've got some, but essentially you must have lots as well, and those are the people we want to focus on. Um, Eileen, kick us off. Introduce yourself. Have you broken that again? I don't think it's my fault. Um, can can I um, can you hear me now? No. Are you switched on? on? Let's see if I'm switched on. This one seems to be switched yep. on. Yes. Is, can you hear? Um, is the microphone working? Can you wind up the? Sorry. Uh, is the microphone working now? Oh yes, it is. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, my name is Eileen Maben. Um, I work as Head of Media Relations at the Fair Trade Foundation in London. Um, the Fair Trade Foundation is the UK member of Fair Trade International, which is based in Bonn. Uh, many of you will know other national initiatives like Max Havilar in the Netherlands or Fair Trade here in Denmark. We're all part, we're all member organisations of Fair Trade International, which is based in Bonn in Germany. Um, the Fairtrade Foundation started up 20 years ago, and when we started, of course, we had virtually no budget. We were dependent on very small grants from organisations like Oxfam or the government. Um, so we were very dependent on trying to get the word, the uh, story of Fairtrade out into the media um, and um, to raise awareness of the Fairtrade mark. Um, uh, and um, that is media that is earned media and that we weren't actually paying for. Um, over the years, we've been very fortunate to get a lot of good coverage on fair trade in the UK media and in other markets also. I think that's because fair trade has a very good story to tell, that we're trying to change trade, trying to do things differently, and also because we have refreshed our campaigns, done innovative campaigns. Um, but the, uh, so we've been very fortunate on that respect. Um, however, I think that when you're actually so dependent on getting media that you're not paying for, that you're then there are consequences, um, and you do open yourself up to inquiry and scrutiny, and we've had plenty of, um, plenty of that also. Um, so um, it, it does have consequences, and one has to expect that. My Danish colleagues have taught me an expression since I've been here, and that's if you stick your nose out. Um, if you stick your nose out, you have to expect someone to try to knock you down. And so we have had um, our fair share of um, criticism in the press. Um, but what we try to do is to use that as an opportunity to be transparent. And actually, we've managed to, to tell a lot of the fair trade story in what started out as being what potentially negative stories, and were a bit painful whenever the journalists came knocking on our door unexpectedly, but we've managed to turn a lot of that out and around and tell a lot of our story through those, um, turn those into opportunities. Thanks, Simon. Anders, introduce yourself, if you would. Okay, uh, my name is Anders Hildemann. I'm um, the forestry manager of IKEA. Uh, what I do in my job is not so much communications or dealing with media and uh, media relations, but occasionally I do as well. Uh, my role is to make sure that all the wood that is used in IKEA products meets our sustainability requirements. And there, one very important component is working with certification, with FSC certification. It's our preferred certification system. Um, this year we have sourced, or last financial year, we sourced about 4 million cubic meters of FSC certified wood, uh, so that all the way up to IKEA. And due to, um, let's say, chain of custody restrictions and so forth, we probably lost another million in the supply chain. Um, so uh, this is our relation with uh, the FSC as a founding member. We've been working with FSC all, the long, all along. And um, uh, what we, just to comment a little bit on, on, on um, K 
Kim's question yesterday evening about sourcing, um, we don't believe that it is enough only to ask for FSE certified wood. We work with our suppliers, our supply chains. We try to de-bottleneck by investing in the supply chains and sometimes also working with uh, partnership projects with, among others, with WWF and, and other partners to help uh, enable certification. Better forest management is, at the end of the day, the objective. But um, doing this, engaging in challenging areas, also opens up for criticism because you will always have to start at some point and work your way towards better and better management. And sometimes we, we God forbid, we make mistakes uh, and do things that are, that are not uh, actually in, in line with where we would like to go. And of course, then we expose ourselves rightly to criticism. Um, I just want to mention, before we start debating also, that IKEA is a company that comes from a culture which is, uh, first you do things and then you talk about it. Uh, and of course, uh, that's not always helpful if you're dealing with media because you're always caught on your back foot, sort of, uh, if you're criticized. And, and here we have a challenge also to change this culture, to be more transparent, to meet stakeholders, to meet media, and maybe not only talk about what we're doing, but also be transparent about the challenges, uh, to be able to address them and, and talk about them, and then talk about what we are already doing. Um, I think that sets the scene a little bit. Thank you. Just two figures. We have about 750 million visits to our stores every year. So, of course, we have an opportunity to communicate there as well. Only about a million of them are from me and my family. Um, <laughs> well, that's just the way it feels sometimes. Alex Alexandra, introduce yourself. Um, Hi, I'm Alexandra Pardal. I'm a campaign leader at Global Witness. Uh, Global Witness is a Nobel Peace Prize nominated NGO, which is best known for our work uncovering the blood diamonds trade and also the trade in conflict timber that uh, allowed and fueled uh, the civil war in Liberia for many years. So we're very well known and in the news at the moment, for example, in relation to Charles Taylor, whose appeal was rejected in The Hague. And we uh, continue to conduct investigations in developing countries. Our focus is the natural resource sector, and within that, uh, forests and forest destruction. So we uncover uh, corruption, we uncover uh, the illegal trade in wood products, and we um, expose publicly what we find and present our evidence in public and to uh, public authorities so that uh, we can actually stamp out um, these egregious abuses. Thank you. Great. Okay. Well, uh, it's open time for you guys now. I, let me kick off some operation whilst you start to form your questions. Eileen, you, you started on a story about fair trade there, and that would be quite interesting to, uh, to people here. You're an organization that needed media to proceed. Um, you didn't have any money to buy it. So just talk to us a bit more about that. Um, well, we, uh, some of the successes that we had were, for example, setting up our annual campaign called Fair Trade Fortnite, which uh, takes place at the beginning of March every year. That also takes place in other countries, in other national markets, also in Paris, in France, they have a two-week campaign, they have Fair Trade Fortnite. Also in Denmark here, they have three one weeks. Those are great times to attract media coverage. For example, in 2009, we had a particularly good year with 5,000 pieces of media coverage in the run-up to Fair Trade Fortnight. Also, our campaigns like Fair Trade Towns, Fair Trade Schools, where these um, they can work towards Fair Trade status, they give lots of opportunity for media, local media coverage, and also, for example, we just had our 1,000th Fair Trade School, and that got national media coverage also. Um, this combined with visibility that the brands have of Fair Trade 
in on the in the shops. Um, it's it works very well to have um, media coverage, brand visibility with or, um, with brands like Ben and Jerry's, Marks and Spencer's, Sainsbury's, um, Cadbury Dairy Milk, um, and the pioneering fair trade brands, Cadbury, um, Cafe Direct, Divine Chocolate. With these visible in the shops, telling the fair trade message also, along with word of mouth, which was what the campaigns the um, around the country are about the schools and the universities and the towns. Where we've had our challenges is when we've had um, neoliberal criticism in the run-up to our campaigns. Um, we had, um, uh, we've had, there were successive years where we had the Institute of Economic Affairs bringing out a report in, just before Fair Trade Fortnight about how fair trade wasn't actually fair, it wasn't going far enough. Um, this was quite, um, quite, always quite difficult in the run up to fair trade fortnight, uh, but we were able, as an organisation that has limited resources, it was an opportunity, it was a mirror shone on ourselves and gave us the opportunity to actually examine some of the uh, some of the criticisms that they made that we because basically we weren't going far enough and we've used the media from the start when we were very small and trying to make a difference but many of the cooperatives were mainly maybe only selling three percent on fair trade terms and so it gave us an opportunity to say that things will be better whenever we grow already we're making a difference already those cooperatives have better um uh, our the, the members of the cooperatives are already much better off because of fair trade. But yes, there, we do have to grow, and only by increasing the volume of products sold on, sold on fair trade terms will we be able to turn around some of these challenges that we're facing. Thanks. Thank you. Um, I have a question down here. I've got a small stack of questions coming up, and I'll, then I'll pose some others. Please, sir. Go ahead. You, yes. Oh, forgive me. You know, man with microphone in his hand, I think. <laughs> Sir, would you like to ask your question? I'm sorry. <laughs> That's a good one. Uh, uh, thank you. Um, uh, my name is Estevão Braga. I'm uh, um, from Susana Pulp and Paper in Brazil. I'm also a, um, a board member there, and uh, we always. I'm curious about um, where we could go in terms of uh, of having tropical wood uh, get more certified. That's a challenge that we have for our FSC there, but also elsewhere around the world. Um, the numbers of uh, uh, tropical forests are shrinking in terms of getting certified. I mean, it used to be 15% of total FSC area, and now it's 10, and it's, it's probably getting lower. So um, I have a question that probably going to be uh, uh, it's uh, half Brad, half Alexandra, which is which way is better to move forest, tropical forest certified? Is either the good stories or the bad ones? I mean, is the carrot or the stick? Which ones would you feel would have a, a bigger impact? I mean, if you look the way things happened in Liberia, for instance, I mean, there's still ways to go, but I mean, it's still, I think the 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 EU ban on imports had a tremendous impact on the way they're doing stuff there. I'm, I'm, that's my taken from you know, an outsider. Um, so I would like to have your perspective in which ways you feel is more efficient in terms of driven tropical forest, uh, you know, into sustainable forest management in terms of communications. Thank you. Thank you. Um, one of you like to take that one on? Sure. Uh, I don't know that it's either or. Uh, I, I don't know the, the drivers. In, and I, I didn't understand if it was loss of FSC certification that we were talking about or deforestation or both. Well, it's, um, uh, it's actually you're getting less area FSC certified. For instance, in Brazil, the same area has been certified for almost a decade now. It's, it's not increasing. So as the other ones are increasing, the, the percentage is shrinking. Well, I, I, th I mean, personally, as FSC, we would want to focus on positive stories, the companies that are FSC certified and doing well with that, and, and the people and, and, and wildlife that are um, ideally uh, doing better under an FSC certified forest management scheme than under a non-certified uh, non one. 
I would think it would be helpful to also have, uh, whether it's a member or other organizations, putting pressure on those uh, forest managers who are not managing to as high a standard, whether it's because they're converting into plantation or uh, whatever the other uh, issues are. I, I think a carrot is nice, and I also think a stick helps um, make people look around for the carrot. So uh, I, I would love to see a little of both in that kind of a scenario. But, but FSC, we're going to focus on the positive stories um, first and foremost and, and trying to tell the stories of the companies that are doing well by using FSC certification. Uh, hopefully those stories exist. I don't, know, I, don't know what the, I don't know what the specifics are. Alexandra, you, I mean, yeah. it's positive and negative also is kind of which viewpoint you're looking from. I mean, from the people who you campaign against, that might, they might see that negative, but from your viewpoint, if that changes, then I guess you see that as a positive message. Talk to us about that. I, I mean, I, I think from FSC's uh, viewpoint, it does no good for your brand to have companies associated with it that are involved in the global illegal timber trade. And when companies are conscious of the fact that there's illegality in their supply chain and do nothing about it, it's bound to come out, to come to light, especially now that you have the EU timber regulations that imposes criminal sanctions on such companies and the Lacey Act in the US as well. I mean, there's just been a huge enforcement action against American retailers that have been um, importing uh, illegal Russian wood. Um, so FSC needs to get its house in order and make sure that all the companies associated with it are completely clean, transparent, and ha have robust due diligence procedures. And uh, this particular case that has come out this week does undermine the FSC brand. And I think uh, there need to be discussions within FSC about what to do about these companies. Thanks for that. Uh, sir, I have a question. you'll need a microphone. <laughs> Good morning. Uh, I'm to you in fair trade. Uh, it's a very interesting matter. We have a company here in Denmark called Jusk. And I think Jusk is one of your members. Is that right? Selling... It, it's okay or not? Yeah. Okay, sorry. I have to do it closer then. No, uh, I think Jusk is one of your companies, right? Aline? Um, uh, Jonas is here from um, Fairtrade in Denmark. Yeah. Um, he would know more about the um, certified products here. One of the com companies in Denmark is, is Jusk, right? Okay, let's, let's find it. We have came yet. Yeah. Can we wind the volume on this? And my question so here is, you know, because yeah, what is very interesting is that we all hear very good things about fair trade. So that's why you can come, come on with that. We, everybody says that you have a very good story, that people are really admiring you for your good stories. My question sometimes is, the stories, the stories you are letting people tell, in the case of Yusk, for example, they are selling FEC certified such called tropical wood, but made out of eucalyptus from the south in Brazil. And sometimes, you know, is that because the, fa the fair trade having, a, is that a, a smear? Is, is that a, a way of saying we are good in training and we like to, to marketing the right products, but what we marketing we don't really like to talk about? Is that one of your points in, in this, this business, for, uh, selling the, 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 the timbers? You don't get me over. Do you, do you Let's get me? not get too deep into detailed cases, but... Right. Sorry, no, no, then, then I'll just refrain from, from talking about it. Okay. Good morning, everyone. My name is Jonas. Uh, I head up the local fair trade office here in Copenhagen. And uh, my, my, uh, my friends from USC are also in the room, so they might want to add something. I just want to be very, very specific here. <laughs> uh, I want to be very specific that um, uh, USC is a, as a license holder of the fair trade cert certificate, uh, of the fair trade certification mark, uh, but only in relation to cotton uh, products. So, so uh, fair trade has standards for cotton, and that is under that certification they work. Thank you. That was a little deeper down a rabbit hole than I expected to go this morning, but. Um, <laughs> Let's see if we can get back up to the surface again. Um, questions? Sir. 
sorry. Uh, I'm uh, uh, Willy Mullins from Chile, CNPC. My impression on FSC uh, awareness is that although us here and people that work with FSC know what FSC stands for, but most of the people I know that are not related, simple consumers that are the end, the ones that are using the products that, that FSC um, certified companies produce have no idea what FSC stands for. And uh, I think that it, what is needed is a simple way of reaching those people with a simple message. Because I know it's not simple to explain what is FSC. But if you make it too complicated, people are not interested at all. So what I would really like to see is a way, maybe even through the members, etc., to, to have a campaign to get awareness of the consumers. What is FSC? What FSC stands for? Why is it good to buy FSC? Because in general, you know, most people I know have no idea what FSC uh, is all about. I, I guess the point for me that I took from that is, and that I'd like to emphasize is that I don't, I don't believe earned media is about raising awareness. I, I, I certainly can reinforce an awareness raising campaign, but that's for me what a, a consumer facing marketing campaign would be about, be about driving meaning to a brand. And, and of course that takes money. But you could also use viral videos. I mean, these days social media can be a powerful way to raise awareness. But a story in a newspaper, a story on a TV news show, yeah, of course, some people will see that who haven't heard of the organization before. But for me, first and foremost, the reason to do that is around credibility. It's around answering questions. It's around speaking to the audiences who are already uh, at least aware of your organization, if not um, familiar with it. Because, and I don't know the Chilean media market at all. Uh, <laughs> But at least in the U.S., the numbers are declining in terms of traditional outlets. Uh, the people who actually read the newspaper tend to be getting older and older. Uh, you know, nightly news is a little bit broader. That's how most people get their news is from television. But even that is still a small slice of the consumer audience. And so I think you have to use marketing if, if your goal is to build a brand. Thanks. Alexandra, talk to us about, we heard yesterday from Daniel Mittler about the way the Greenpeace approach campaigns and you know, its relationship to the media, use of the media, it must be changing a hell of a lot with social media coming in. You know, I wouldn't be surprised if in 10 years time the whole thing is different from what Brad was saying. Talk to us about Global Witness and how they approach their campaigns. In terms of how we use the media, we still use traditional media uh, you know, uh, pr the print press, uh, radio, TV, and that's what we've done this week. I mean, we've been tweeting, et cetera, but that's actually not um, the main means for carrying the story. Most people still get their news from the radio, from watching TV, and yeah, they still, you know, read the broadsheets. Um, so we focused, for example, this week on Denmark Radio, it's the Danish version of the BBC. It's a credible outlet. Uh, they do good reporting. We've also worked with Politiken on, re on releasing the story. It's the main broadsheet uh, newspaper here, very credible as well, with very good journalists. The work we do is uh, investigative. We gather original evidence. Everything uh, we release has been uh, verified properly. So we want to work with journalists who can appreciate th that kind of information and present it in a way that's balanced and that also, I mean, engages, obviously, those um, companies we're talking about. In this particular case, uh, when we um, prepared our story, we went to DLH last week. Uh, we presented our evidence to them. We said uh, we have evidence uh, of export permits showing uh, that you uh, bought and exported illegal private use permit timber from Liberia. 
Uh, we also have evidence, photographic evidence of this timber in your shipyard in France. Uh, we have evidence from the authorities in Liberia of the fact that you were trading in this timber. So we put that to them so that they were also ready to respond to their allegations. They had a right of response. Um, they actually came back and, and confirmed they had bought uh, timber, um, in particular under private use permit three. Um, but what we've seen in the media uh, yesterday and today is a textbook incompetent response uh, from a company, uh, basically saying, yes, we bought the timber, because that they can't refute, um, but saying we couldn't have done anything differently. So trying to minimize the story um, and not actually presenting their mea culpa and uh, not offering um, any uh, commitment to what they're going to do to rectify uh, their own approach. The story is about uh, the, the biggest uh, land grab in Liberian uh, history since the Civil War. 23% of the land mass of Liberia was corruptly and fraudulently allocated under private use permits. Uh, the a UN panel of experts report in November 2011, well before DLH uh, bought the timber and imported it, said that these permits could uh, present a new form of conflict financing and undermine sustainability and anti-corruption efforts. Uh, DLH knew about NGO reports uh, that these permits were illegal. Uh, so they've, they've admitted that they saw these NGO reports at the time, and yet they say, we couldn't have done anything differently. So this story is going to run and run until they actually uh, rectify what they did and give back the $300,000 that was stolen from Liberian rural communities in one of the poorest countries uh, on earth. Uh, that is the issue, and I think uh, FSC um, is also going to be dragged into the dispute unless DLH actually does something to rectify what it did. Thank you. Well, <clears throat> as they say on the British media, whenever something specific is mentioned, there are other points of view. And I dare say there are other points of view, but that's a, an excellent example of a case and how they approach it. And as you must... I'm faced with a complete... Ah, a question. Can we get a microphone over here? This lady here. Thank you. Hi, my name is Susan Brunner. I'm from Mondi. Um, I have a question to Brad in particular from a communications perspective. Uh, I can obviously speak more for the paper industry, but there's an overwhelming negative perception of paper in the media, but also by many large and small companies, because the first thing they do if they want to be sustainable is to say they cut their paper usage. And then they often fall into the trap of greenwash saying, we've saved six trees by cutting down so and, or by using so and so much less paper. Um, I think it's also relevant to the fiber-based packaging industry as well, but what is FSC doing to combat this negative image of using forest-based products? So I'm going to be wearing my US hat here because that's not really an issue that I've dealt with at the international level. Uh, we actually have a colleague who's, who's a group in the US called the Environmental Paper Network. And we're working with them. Uh, their message has been recycled first. Uh, and if you must use Virgin, use FSC. And of course, that, that message is close to, to what we want, but it's not quite there. Um, we're we're trying, to trying to get them to understand that even recycled fiber was once a tree. So you know, we talk about if you're laundering mixed tropical hardwoods into post-consumer fiber or recycled fiber, is that is that a good is that a good thing? And I, I think good people might disagree on whether it is or isn't. But we're trying to show that the quality of the forest management, wherever you know, whether you're using the fiber for the for the first time, so who's that me? Whether you're using the fiber for the first time, the second time, the third time, it started in a forest. And, and we're trying to move, so this is not a communications issue first and foremost, because we're trying to move that, the, that group's position uh, on paper, but, but as a communications issue, we always 
uh, talk about post-consumer recycled or FSC certified as equivalent because it, it all originates in a forest at one point or another, and the quality of the forest management is is going to matter. And and so you know we we have folks predominantly in our environmental chamber that we'll just say we we've, we've been having a robust discussion with them on the merits of FSC. Now, you know, it's, it, it is a fine line because we don't, I think it's fair to say paper is still wasted, you know, in offices and in, you know, around the world. People print and just a lot, you look in any recycling bin in any, any company and there's, in, in my office, there's just paper being wasted. We, of course, would like to see that waste reduced, but at the same time, we all use paper. And so, you know, we try to, to walk the line where we say, uh, and, and we do this in our newsletter, and we do this in, you know, interviews with the C mostly CSR type publications that would be interested in, you know, this kind of a story, but try to make the case that, you know, the quality of the forest management matters, uh, and we all rely on paper to, to, do our, to do our work, to live our lives, and, uh, we see equivalence between uh, FSC certified from uh, Virgin and, and also post-consumer recycled. And sometimes the, what you need the paper for will also drive the decision. It's not always as cut and dry. So I, I guess I, I would just say we're pushing against that message. I think we've got some distance to go. Thanks for that. Anders, you, you started off in your introduction on quite an interesting exploration of um, how you can, how you can, how large companies can take risks, or how they should take risks um, with their business, or to try to develop things. And the question then is, how do you explain that to the world in a way that the world understands and indeed believes in? Right. Okay. Um, well, I think, I think just to give this um, a context, uh, I was saying that we are using four million cubic meters of FSC certified wood. That's a pretty solid story to tell. Uh, but we are actually using 14 million cubic meters of wood in total to produce the articles of solid wood and board material in IKEA. Uh, the 10 million cubic meters that we are sourcing that are not FSC certified, not reaching FSC, uh, IKEA as FSC certified, is an area where we are working with other methods to ensure that they meet our, at least our minimum requirements for sourcing, and we've been doing this since 1998. Um, with a, a company culture like IKEA's, where we have said that we want to get things done before we to communicate too loudly about it, um, it's, a, it's a challenge to talk about these things because um, uh, the, we are growing by maybe six, seven percent per year, and this is a work that will never be finished. We'll be working with this all the time to promote better forest management. The difficulty is, of course, here to firstly get your message out, uh, to find the right channels to uh, talk about it, and also coming from the type of culture we have to not only talk about all the good things we're doing, but talk about the challenges and not be afraid of, of engaging in these challenging areas. Um, I think this is, this is really one of, one of the key things um, that, uh, and, and a balance that of course has to be struck with organizations like uh, Global Witness or Greenpeace, uh, that you want responsible companies to engage in challenging areas. And at some point, of course, you shouldn't go to certain areas, but on the other hand, you need to provide the time to engage, uh, and, and, and it takes time. If you go into Russia and you want to certify an operation, if you start from scratch, it might take you two, three years. Uh, and in that time, you need to work with them. You need to make sure that they have a market for their products, even though they're not certified. Otherwise, they don't have the means for working with certification. Um, so, so uh, in, in essence here, we need to be better in, in the way we communicate. We need to be more bold, brave, uh, to talk with stakeholders. Um, and here's, of course, the strength of the FSC. 
Um, we are located in the supply chain three, four steps away from the forest. And if we are sourcing FSC certified wood, we will have a, a, at least a strong guarantee that there has been a stakeholder engagement and that you have had the dialogue that is absolutely necessary for us to feel confident uh, that we are dealing with responsible forestry. Thank you. I think I'm causing some of the feedback. Etienne. Hello. Wait, is that working? A uh, question for Brad. Brad, it came up at the um, dinner table that I was at last night that we don't always respond to negative press. And, uh, you know, the conversation was about, you know, we, we're the FSC, we have limited resources, we're not always able to do that. But I wondered if you could kind of share your perspective on, you know, because certainly in the U.S., as, you know, we work together, we talk about and, you know, we discuss being very purposeful in deciding what we're going to respond to. Because there is a perspective too that in responding, you can be adding fuel to a fire and, and creating more attention. So I wondered if you could just kind of talk through that kind of filtering process, if you will, of, uh, you know, there's negative press out there, do we respond or not? Yeah, uh, I would say that one of the challenges of the media landscape these days is that it's hard to know what's media. I mean, you know, there are blogs that are very small but very influential. And then, of course, there's the International Herald Tribune or the Financial Times or the BBC. You know, you know, some things are very obvious, but these days it's not always obvious just based on what the outlet is, whether you need to respond or not. Um, so, but that is one screen is, you know, where is this happening? And, you know, there's... In, in, many, in some ways, there are many, many more outlets today than there were 10 years ago. People talk about decline of media, but there's actually a massive growth in media. And, and for people who are trying to sell stories, uh, there's many more outlets. I mean, just in terms of CSR, there's, there's hundreds of CSR blogs and print, I mean, not so many print pieces, but influential. And some of these have real reach and, and actually shape perspectives. So I, I try to look at, you know, where is this coming out? And then I try to get a sense of what is this public, what is this publication? There are, uh, in the U.S., there are many um, far-right publications that, no matter what we say, they're not. If we respond, it's going to be another chance to attack FSC. And so, you know, if I think it's going to be an objective publication or reporter, and we have a chance to respond, and it's influential, then you know, absolutely. So, for example, we. You know, next or two weeks, we're you know flying, you're going to Portland, Oregon, where the Oregonian, Oregon is a, a large timber producing state. The Oregonian had a negative piece on FSC that was uh, planted by one of our competing schemes, and uh, you know that is a, a example where we felt like we had to organize a group of people throughout the supply chain to go meet with the editors at the Oregonian, and we're investing a day in, in that because that that's the kind of outlet that if if their editorial position is anti-FSC in the state of Oregon, that could have real lasting um, negative implications for us. And, and since factually most of what they wrote was incorrect, we felt like, well, that's, that's worth our time to go meet with them and, and try to walk them back through you know, how we really operate. Now, if it, that same thing had been written in a, you know, a, a small blog that is, is targeting Tea Party Republicans, which that's the kind of media segregation I mean, we have that kind of segregation going on in media these days. I don't, I don't think we would have put the same effort into it because that would just be another opportunity for them to take a hit at us. So those are the kinds of things. And, and frankly, then, yeah, capacity sometimes comes into play as well because on a given day, we might have around the world, you know, 50 to 100 different things going on. And, you know, obviously we can't respond to all of them. And sometimes it's worthy of putting out a statement that at least states our position and, and interested reporters can pick it up, but we can't always, you know, go retail level back to everyone. Thank you. Uh, Judy. Hi. <clears throat> it's, my name is Judy Rodriguez from Greenpeace International, and this is to uh, Brad to follow up on that. Um, I'm just wondering, is, is the general approach by FSC to act um, to react to negative news, or how is FSC, in a way, preparing and armoring itself to to deal with the varying levels of performance? I mean, let's let's face it. I mean, it's we can't guarantee a perfect system. 
Um, Greenpeace has been increasingly concerned with the growing number of poor performance of bad actors uh, on the ground, uh, companies and CBs, and uh, it's the reality, right? Um, so I'm just wondering how, how FSC is um, armoring itself, let's say, um, externally. And then a second question about, um, do you ever um, consider its importance, uh, Im the importance of communicating to the membership if there is a big media flurry? Uh, so the first one, you know, well, I'm th thrilled to say that actually FSC International has a new communications director starting on November 1st. Um, that position has actually been unfilled for some period of time, so, uh, which is why I've been advisor uh, in that position. But, um, it, it, you know, yes, so clearly we'll have uh, more leadership and that will be a wonderful thing. Um, we, I, I think our, our first uh, responsibility is to transparency. But that doesn't mean just lobbing everything out there into the public sphere. And frankly, most of, at least in the, the time that I've been working with FSC International, most of what we have to do, especially when it's you know, on deadline, is try to get our arms around just what the facts of the situation are. Try to talk to the certifying body. Try to talk to the certificate holder. Try to talk to some stakeholders who we know in the area. You know, and sometimes this is happening you know, when we said we'd get back to the reporter by the end of the day. And, you know, and the issue is happening half the world away. So frequently the scramble and, and the, the lag time is just you know, trying to understand what, you know, what we can learn about the situation. We, of course, hear, hear about it from someone who has a, has a position. Uh, frequently that someone isn't you know, the certified company. And, and then we have to try to understand what, what the issues are and establish at least the facts as we can. I mean, sometimes we can look at things like, has a dispute been put into our dispute resolution system? And if that hasn't even happened, well then, officially, we don't even know about it. I mean, we do, of course, because people tell us, but, but you know, if it's in there, then we can read what the dispute is, and we can say a dispute has been lodged and we're gonna launch an investigation. But, you know, we, we, have, to, we have to look at that kind of detail to understand how to respond. And, you know, and, and then, at the international level, frequently a question is, you know, is this something best handled by our national office in that country, or is this the kind of issue that is big enough that we would elevate it? So that, that would be another screen. And, and the third screen, of course, is, you know, wh what else do we have going on? Can we actually just get the people together to talk about this and, and make some decisions, especially if it's, it's on a timeline? That's, this is why my my whole presentation was about pushing towards strategic and proactive communications because that's it's more of a vision statement, but it's what we would like to do is, um, and frankly, some of the things that, that Anders said, I mean, going into a difficult place, uh, I, you know, I don't know if IKEA would want to do this or not, but with, we would, I think it would make a good story for all parties to look at some of the really difficult issues in the FSC system, but do it in a way that isn't responding to a, a crisis or a reporter inquiry. Find a reporter who we think will be fair, figure out who the stakeholders are who are relevant to that story, provide real access to that reporter, including the FSC perspective, but also the NGO perspective, the certificate holder perspective, maybe local folks in that community, and, and that, we exist because these issues are difficult, so I don't think we can shy away from the difficult issues, and that, frankly, is what makes good stories. But what we want to try to control is reporters who are going to be fair and at least do the work well. We don't want to just throw someone at that who's going to be casual or biased or, or frankly, not understand the, the sensitivity of the issue, someone who can invest. And that, that's, frankly, the hardest part, is finding that kind of a reporter. But, uh, but I think for certain stories, it's worth doing it. Um, there was a second question that I'm not forgetting. The second bit, I, I know you're going to be sensitive about the fact that there's an incoming communica inter communications director and you don't want to commit anybody to anything. Oh, yeah. But None of that was a back, commitment. You know, has, the, has the organization been good enough at keeping its own members oh, yeah. up to pace with what's going on? No. <laughs> no, I guess I was, just, I was just more curious about if there is a serious me media flurry attack or news think, story, you know, do you think it's important to c communicate in a way to the 
members, membership audience. Typically, the way that would happen would be through the network. So the members are all members of FSC International, but they're, U, they're national based. So we have US based members of FSC International. So typically, uh, there's sensitivities that are country specific around whatever the issue might be. And usually the way FSC International will operate is, I mean, the reality is there are very few stakeholders of FSC International. The relationships are, are largely, not entirely, but largely with the national offices, the people who are on the ground around the world. And it's always, I think, safer to at least rely on those folks to understand is the story relevant? What's the sensitivity? How, and, and you know, most of these national offices have their own communications vehicles. It, it certainly varies. But typically, I think we would rely on the national offices to communicate with the members in their countries about those issues. Sometimes FSC International does, there is a newsletter. I think, I don't know if it just goes, I, I, sh I think it's a sign up. It's an opt in kind of thing. But um, the sensitive stuff, it's usually through the, net, the network, which is the national offices. Thanks, Brad. Eileen, you wanted to um, add to I that? I wanted to come in um, here, if that's OK. Sure. Um, is this microphone working now? It is. Yes. Oh, OK, oh, good. Um, I just wanted to share a little bit about our experience. And um, as Brad said, I think that um, it's very difficult at times when journalists are using tactics that aren't fair. Um, but um, generally, journalists are actually wanting to get to the truth. They're wanting to stand up for the public interest and find out um, um, what the truth of the matter is. So I think that organisations like ours, which are transparent, we do need to, um, um, however painful it can be, um, the Fair Trade Foundation sees it as our responsibility when these stories, um, critical stories come out, to try to respond. Um, and it is an opportunity to lay out our case, um, our business case, give a more nuanced um, story about fair trade. But I think that um, we're actually doing ourselves a disservice if we feel locked into answering the questions which are actually put before us. Because sometimes the journalist has got the wrong end of the stick. And we need to actually use this as a platform to actually explain the, our story in a more rounded way and talk about the values which underpin what we're actually doing. For example, the Fair Trade Foundation has been criticised when journalists have found um, child labour in, in the supply chain. Of course, that's um, completely against our standards. But what we have to immediately say is, at least with fair trade, it's against our standards. And when it's found, there's a mechanism to actually report that and for us to do something about that and to do some support for the families and communities where that is happening. So I think that we have to use these um, opportunities as a, as a means of communicating, educating the public that our it, issues are complicated, they're difficult, it's not, we don't have easy solutions, but that they must come with us on the journey to try and sort these things out. Because the simplicity of media often um, does brush strokes things and makes it look as if we're incompetent and we're not doing our job. We know we're doing our job and we know why we're doing it and we need to have the confidence and to have spokespersons in the organisation who can stand up and, um, and take the heat. Fortunately, I've, I'm in the press office and so I push the directors forward for that job. Um, I had some slides which I was going to show that despite the negative media that the Fair Trade Foundation has had, but I don't think we've really got time. I don't know if we've got time to see them or not. But basically, that sales have continued to grow. That awareness of the fair trade mark has continued, even in the difficult years where we did have um, negative media coverage, that continue, sales continue to grow. And one in nine people trust the fair trade mark. So I think that that is quite testament to the fact that if you tell your story properly in the media, that people will listen to you. Because remember, we're not talking to everyone. We're talking to the people who are possibly sympathetic to our issues. We in the Fair Trade Foundation, now that we have, have grown and have a bit of a marketing budget, have done analysis. And there's about 40% of the public in the UK that are potential fair trade buyers. They're not all choosing fair trade. And those are the people that we're speaking to. So even if you're doing a media interview, you're not speaking to the journalists, you're not speaking to, the gen to everyone out there, but you are speaking to the people who can be persuaded. Thanks for that. Question down here. Can we have a microphone over here? Thank you. Hi, 
Hi, it's Natasha Feiler from Bristol Zoo. Hi. Um, I've got a question probably mainly for Brad, and it's more kind of going back to the positive stories angle. Um, obviously, working for a zoo, I kind of come into FSC from a conservation sort of background and viewpoint. Um, and I think we've spoken a lot, not just today, but also yesterday, about positive stories through talking about people. But I think something that, which we haven't engaged with as much is... Um, the sort of positive impact that stories about animals and conservation can also have on FSC. Um, because I think, obviously, animals are a very emotional sort of tool in engaging different communities in families and children with FSC. Um, so I was just wondering if you had any comments on sort of your efforts to sort of use that side of the organization to promote kind of positive stories. Uh. Not as much as I'd like, but absolutely. I guess my point about people was that at the end of the day, even animal stuff, and I've actually worked, uh, done communications with a zoo. I, I live two blocks from the, the Woodland Park Zoo, which is in Seattle, and have done some work for them and um, am a big supporter. Even when we are talking about uh, the conservation work that they do or, or the animals in, their, in the zoo, you know, the pictures are always of the animals. And we're always talking about the conservation benefits, whether through habitat work they're doing or whether through you know, uh, population uh, growth they're doing in certain species. But it's always people doing those interviews. I mean, you know, they, you know, they, they've been releasing western pond turtles, which is an endangered species, back into the wild in our region. The western pond turtle is notoriously shy in media interviews, uh, but... The scientist who can talk about the decline and subsequent uh, growth of those populations is actually quite charismatic, and as is the you know the land manager where those pond turtles are being released. And so my point wasn't that you know the trees and the the wildlife and all of the other things don't matter. For many people, that is of course central. You're still going to talk to the people to get the stories and finding the right people. Um, is still where I end up investing a lot of time to do media well because you know not everyone's going to be a good interview. The pond turtles, you know, they have an excuse, but but there's plenty of people that you can put in front of a reporter and it's not going to go well. Either they're at the best they're boring, and at the worst they just you know don't they're just off point and saying things that are potentially harmful. So you know you want you want to do the legwork to find the good people. Um, you know, first and foremost, I guess that's what I was meaning. Thanks. Yeah, I think at the same time, I think all I meant is that there's not enough positive stories going around about the links that FSC has to conservation and to good forest management and the fact that, you know, you were saying earlier on sort of 70% of land species actually live in forests and that's a really powerful message that can be used perhaps more effectively in promoting FSC. I think that's just the point I was trying to make, not so much interviewing the turtles. Well, I, that would be lovely. No, I, know. I, was, <laughs> I was being cheeky. To, uh, I agree. I don't think there's been enough proactive stories as, as a whole. Um, I actually suspect my colleagues at FSC UK might love to you know, speak with you. Did you say you were in Bristol? Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Thanks. Thanks for that. Incidentally, Teo, I think that that's the lady who asked you the rude question about polar bears. It's a dating site up here as well, but anyway, there she is. <laughs> uh, it's 10.15. I'm not faced with a forest of questions, so I think maybe we'll, maybe we'll call it a day. Uh, we're on time, which is good. Thank you. Brad, Alexandra, Anders, Eileen. Thank you very much. <laughs>